So uh, we have been studying the Lotus Sutra for, for quite a while now, and we're on chapter 25. And this is the universal gateway of the Bodhisattva of Alakateshvara. This is Guan Shuryin Pusa, the one who hears the cries or sounds of the world. And this is perhaps the most popular single chapter in all Asian Buddhism, especially popular among lay people. It was closely related to the name reciting of the Buddha in the Amitabha Sutra, where Avalokiteshvara is described as accompanying Amitabha to, um, to help great devotees at the moment of death and bring them to the Pure Land. Uh, during various periods in Chinese history, this chapter has circulated as a separate sutra, the Guanyin Sutra. And it was so popular that there was a saying, Amitabha in every family, Guanyin in every household. In this chapter, Guan Shuryin is shown to be the greatest of all the bodhisattvas, second only to the Buddha. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, I opened my um, email this morning and there was a, a note from a Tibetan Lama which had a prayer for um, Avalokiteshvar, which I may read at the end. I thought that was very auspicious. So anyway, throughout Chinese history, Guan Shuryin has had great importance. When the Chinese monk Fa, uh, Fa Shen traveled to Mathura in India around 400 in the Common Era, he wrote about monks presenting offerings to Avalokiteshvara. When Shan Zong uh, traveled to India in the seventh century, he provided eyewitness accounts of Avalokiteshvara statues being venerated by devotees from all walks of life, kings, monks, and lay people. In Japan, there are 33 designated pilgrimage routes, each one dedicated to one of Guanyin's manifestations. And some believe that the Dalai Lama is himself an incarnation of Avalokiteshvara. So um, what I wanna do now is give a very brief summary of, of the sutra. And this is going to be brief and superficial and some of the superficiality that comes through in, in this summary. And also if you read this sutra quickly and you gloss over some things, you might come up with what I'm about to talk to you about. So the chapter begins with the Bodhisattva Wu Jini, which is um, Aksaya Mati, the inexhaustible mind or inintention, asking Shakyamuni Buddha, why is Guan Shur Yin, you know, Avalokiteshvara, why is Guan Shur Yin called Guan Shur Yin? The Buddha explains that if sentient beings in distress call his name, Guan Shur Yin will appear and rescue them. The Buddha goes on to describe desperate situations like fire, drowning, being beaten, attacked by demons, or being beset by the three poisons, greed, hatred and ignorance. All these misfortunes, um, internal and external, can be overcome by calling on Guan Shuryin's name. And, and Guan Shuryin is not just about distress. Um, it says in the sutra that Guan, uh, uh, Guan Shuryin can help a woman who wishes to give birth to a boy or a girl, and, and they will turn out to be um, fine progeny. Uh, sentient beings have to call um, wholeheartedly with one, one mind to invoke Guan Yin's help. Guan Shur Yin can take any form of being from a Buddha to any kind of being in the six realms in order to save a particular being. Um, Guan Shur Yin is extolled over all other bodhisattvas in this chapter and in many other places. And finally, um, Aksayamati presents a necklace to Guan Shuryin and another bodhisattva. Um, uh, at the end of the sutra, uh, Jirdi Pusa, the earth holder, declares the truth of Guan, Sh Guan Shuryin's powers. So that's kind of what happens in the sutra. 
which in itself is, depending on how you look at it, is, is quite interesting or something that could be just glossed over very quickly in a summary as I just did. So one of the things I wanna point out how this chapter di uh, differs from the preceding chapters, first of all, before I get into more, more specifics. One thing about this, this chapter is there's no defensiveness. The talk about slandering the sutra or even the need to uphold the whole sutra. The entire sutra, very uncharacteristically in the Lotus Sutra, is not mentioned. Just the, the, the chapter itself is mentioned. And of course, scholars will take that fact because you know, obviously when the Buddha was speaking, I think this is obvious, he didn't say, um, uh, well, we're gonna start chapter 25 now, everybody. So, you know, take out your notepads. This is before writing existed. Um, nonetheless, you know, I, I believe in the, um, in, in many forces uh, outside of what I can conceive, and I'm perfectly happy accepting this as um, part and parcel of the, the Buddha's intention and mission. So let me just go over some of the earlier teachings to kind of um, uh, contextualize where we are. So I'm not gonna talk about the, the first half of the sutra, but we are um, in what Thich Nhat Hanh called the action part of the sutra. That begins in chapter 20. And anyone who's been listening will know that um, that's the chapter on the Bodhisattva never, never disparaging, who sees Buddha, Buddha nature in all beings, even though the word Buddha nature doesn't actually explicitly appear in the sutra. Then in chapter 21 is the transcendent powers of the Buddha, the endless continuation of the Dharma symbolized by the Buddha stretching, the Buddhas stretching their tongues up to the Brahma heavens. And in uh, chapter 22, the entrustment chapter describes the Buddha touching the heads of his disciples and sending his transformation bodies back across the universe to where they were before chapter 11, which was the great stupa. And I know when, when I'm speaking like this, I feel like I'm talking uh, about a storybook, which is exactly what the sutra isn't. <laughs> but you can uh, elicit a plot in it Right, because there are events and there are there are stories, but they have much deeper meaning than just what seems to transpire. So then there is chapter twenty three, the former deeds of the Med uh, Bodhisattva Medicine King, that shows the supreme offering of the Bodhisattva's body um, through immolation, self immolation, and perfect dedication to the Dharma. And then in chapter twenty four. Wonderful sound Bodhisattva has learned to transform through his great Guan Yin does this too, but in a, in a different way or with a different power, if you will. So I emphasize the superficiality of my summary because even though I recognized and have faith in the actuality of Guan Shi Yin as I understand it, um, and indeed uh, Sherpu, Master Sheng Yin, described how he prayed to Guan Shi Yin as an important part of the founding of Dharma Drum Mountain. I also recognize that many people in dire circumstances have needs that are met in a deep reverence for the sutra and the five practices that the sutra continually talks about of embracing, upholding, reading, reciting, and teaching. I'm also wary of people who have the view that Guan Shi Yin is some kind of a Santa Claus in the sky or a celestial grandmother who has no other, no other purpose but to satisfy material cravings. Uh, additionally, um, you, you might get the impression um, if you just breeze through the chapter and don't investigate further that, um, you know, that you, especially if you have some sort of superhero or savior syndrome, and it's really part of our culture you know, Marvel Comics, DC Comics. Um, this is, uh, this goes way back even in, in with heroes in, in, in ancient history. There's some kind of um, powerful being 
or you know, natural or supernatural that we can call on, it will help us. And it reminds me of, there's a line from Bob Dylan, and I'm, some of you may, may or not be familiar with the, with the Lone Ranger, but the line goes, the Lone Ranger and Tonto were moving down the line, helping everybody's troubles, everybody's but mine. Someone must have told them I was doing fine. So even in that line, you know, Bob Dylan is sort of questioning this, this kind of uh, um, complex that, 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 that many of us have, you know, on some level, of looking for something to save us, something that's outside of ourselves. So with that caveat and, uh, and with the introduction, I wanna look more deeply into the chapter. And uh, I'm, I'm greatly helped by Master Sheng Yen's book, um, Zhuan Miao um, Shuo Fa, which is, I guess, the uh, exquisite Dharma teaching. This is his book uh, about the, uh, the Lotus Sutra. And there were just remarkable um, insights in it, um, which unfortunately, in the time that I have, I'm not gonna be able to, to go through all of them, but I hope I, I give you enough of uh, to kind of whet your added appetite to, to look further. So, you know, we have to start with, with, with the characters, the name of the sutra, really to get a way of orienting ourselves. So Master Sheng Yang gives an analysis of guan, which um, means to perceive or to regard, to contemplate, sure, which is um, the world, the universe perhaps, yin, which is um, voice or sound or teaching, sometimes tone. And these, um, the words, if you look them up in a dictionary just aren't sufficient to give you the depth of the meaning of how, how this is really to be understood. So Shurfu writes that in the authentic Lotus Sutra, that's a work um, um, in, in, in the, uh, the, uh, the Dharma canon, um, Guan, Guan Shu Yin's name is um, translated as Guang uh, Shu Yin, illuminated voice of the world. And in, in the Heart Sutra, I'm sure as many people know, it's translated as Guan Sudzai, contemplating freedom. And what Shurfu explains is that contemplating is the one mind, three wisdoms that enables contemplation. Now I'm going to come back to that term, which comes from Tian Tai. Um, but let me just go further. So um, the, the, um, the, wor the, the, the world um, yeah, are the sent sentient beings in the 10 Dharma realms that are contemplated, that are the, the subject, uh, which is a, a word that I'm gonna get rid of very soon, but the, the or the object of Guan, Guan Shi Yin's contemplation, right? And, um, uh, and contemplating is Bodhisattva's um, responsiveness. And the, um, the voices can also be understood as the emotions, the experience of sentient beings who are crying out for Guan Yin's help. So Shurfu mentions this term, which is really important in understanding what's going on in the sutra of um, Gan, Gan Ying, which is um, Gan means um, feeling, emotion, maybe, maybe experience. Ying is to, to respond, to correspond, to answer in a way. So it's to feel and respond. And what this term Gan Ying actually means, it's, it's the communion of the minds of Buddhas and practitioners. And it points to the non-differentiation of Buddhas and sentient beings. We are all, we're all Buddhas and, and Buddhas are participate in our world. So um, the mind of faith and or the good roots of sentient beings affect the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and cause them to respond. Remember, there's, there's, there's a lot to the calling on um, 
Guan Shu Yun. It's not just a, hey, hello, could you give me a hand here? It's, there's a, something much deeper going on. So, and it's, it's, the, it's the reception of our mind of faith by the Buddha and his response to it. That's what Gan Yin, Ying is. And, you know, this is also a term used in, in Pure Land. So with that understanding of this special relationship between Buddhas and sentient beings, which, which is, we'll see, is, is a, a non-dualistic relationship, because where all this is pointing is that Guan Shi Yin is something that we call upon because we're calling upon the Guan Shi Yin that is inside us. It's not he or she. Remember, uh, um, Guan Shi Yin sometimes is understood as female, um, and it, in different parts of the world at different time times, the the the, the sexual description of Guan, Guan Shi Yin has changed. I'm probably gonna to refer to him as he just for simplicity. Now let's talk about the one mind, three wisdoms that Shurfu mentioned in, in explaining Guan. Now I, I want to, to give you some idea of what this is, but without you know, getting overwhelmed by it, but it's a very important term. It comes from Tiantai Buddhism, which had a very um, strong, uh, both scholastic and practice orientation, was very influential on Chan. And what it means is, first of all, the Yixin, one mind, is mind as mind, nothing else but mind. This is what we encounter. Um, when we meditate, it's our mind um, encountering our mind, <laughs> or and it's not even um, personal. It's mind encountering mind. Right? But um, the three wisdoms are different views of reality, and this is according to Tiantai doctrine. And it's very important, not necessarily to get um, too caught up in in these distinctions, but to understand that. The, the basis behind coming up with terms like this is to show how Buddhas and great Bodhisattvas use um, expedient means to reach us, to, to understand what our issues are and how they can bring us to the other shore, which may be this shore. So the, the first uh, of these three wisdoms or views, if you will, is jia, which means literally false. And that is the relative world that we live in. Um, it's, the, it's all of our, um, the objects, everything we encounter, our anxiety, um, which we take for reality, even though there's maybe something, and there's definitely something um, behind it, or within it, or without it. But but not, not what we project in our mind. So that's the world of Jia. And then the next world um, wisdom is Zheng, which is the absolute, which is truth, which is what is correct. And Shanti Deva explains these two terms in a very simple way, in that the, um, uh, he, he's actually not, ex not explaining Tian Tai, he's explaining the, um, relative and absolute more from the Madhyamaka school, but I think it's all pretty much the same, that the Ja is what we can talk about, what we can see, what we can conceive. And the Jung is what cannot be spoken about, what cannot be encountered with our um, senses. So, um, it, you know, that's a, a, a pretty, um, even though these, these uh, the concepts are not necessarily particularly easy. And of course the experience of them is, is you know, a lifetime of practice. But then there is a third wisdom, which is Jung, which means middle. And that combines these first two, the, the relative and the absolute, um, the nominal and the provisional and, um, you know, the, uh, what is uh, perfectly true. It combines them, but it also transcends them. It's, it's not 
um, not something that we can really understand with our conceptual minds. This is really in the realm of the Buddhas and uh, great Bodhisattva Mahasattvas. Um, so, so they don't they don't really distinguish from my understanding be, between these different wisdoms, but they are aware of them because sentient beings are still caught caught in the saha world, in the world of samsara. So now drilling down a little bit further, I think it's really important to understand the, the, the nature of Guan Yin, um, his practice, his, um, his spiritual powers, everything about him. He's, uh, because when we read these sutras, we look at the um, persona in them the characters, if you will, almost as if they're in a play, as if they have some territory and they're here and they're not there. And there's, um, you know, we think they exist for a certain period of time and maybe they cease to exist, um, even though we don't necessarily think in those terms. Um, but it's almost like in the, um, the there's the un universal dwelling of Manjushri, uh, which is a sutra which talks about how uh, you know, um, Manjushri, Manjushri is a great bodhisattva, is non-localized, and certainly Guan Shuryin is non-localized everywhere. So here's a passage from the Surangama Sutra, part, part six, section two. This, this explains what um, Guan Shuryin did to become Guan Shuryin. And I think it's um, it's two middle-sized paragraphs, but I think it's very important. So I will read them, and you know, hopefully you'll you'll, you'll get some uh, picture of this if you're not familiar with the Surangama. So Guan Shur Yin vowed to become a Buddha in front of a Buddha named Guan Shur Yin, which is interesting in and of itself. So he said, "I began with a practice based on the enlightened nature of hearing. First, I redirected my hearing." inward in order to enter the current of the sages. Then external sounds disappeared. With the direction of my hearing reversed and with sound stilled, both sounds and silence ceased to arise. So it was that as I gradually progressed, what I heard and my awareness of what I heard came to an end, came to an end which is pretty mind boggling. Um, and even when that state of mind in which everything had come to an end disappeared, I did not rest. My awareness and the objects of my awareness were emptied. And when that process of emptying my awareness was wholly complete, then even that emptying and what had been emptied vanished. Coming into being and ceasing to be themselves ceased to be. Then the ultimate stillness was revealed. Uh, Master Xuan Wa's commentary on that passage is, <clears throat> you reverse your hearing to listen to your own true nature. So now we get into, this is how Guan Yin then talks about how he acquired the powers um, and the um, uh, state of mind that he did and, um, and how he could help sentient beings. So all of a sudden I transcended the world's of ordinary beings. And I also transcended the worlds of beings who have transcended the ordinary worlds. Everything in the 10 directions was fully illuminated. And I gained two remarkable powers. First, my mind ascended to unite with the fundamental, wondrous, enlightened mind of all Buddhas in all 10 directions. And my power of compassion became the same as theirs. Second, my mind descended to unite with all beings of the six destinies in all 10 directions, such that I felt their sorrows and their prayerful yearnings as my own. So once again, non-separation. World honored one, because I made offerings to the thus come one who hears the cries of the world, I received from that thus come one, a hidden transmission of a Vajra-like Samadhi such that my power of compassion became the same as the Buddha's. I was then able to go to all lands and appear in um, uh, 30, 32 forms that respond to what beings required. So that's, that's quite a passage. And this, that Guan Yin, that passage from the Surin Gama Sutra, that 
perfectly describes what we're encountering here in, in the Lotus Sutra. So any, any kind of superficial understanding of what's going on in, in this sutra just doesn't have the, the depth uh, of who we're, who we're talking about. Um, so once again, so for sentient beings, it says in the, in the sutra, it's yi xin cheng, cheng ming, right? Um, a unified mind, yi xin, which is a very concentrated, um, devoted practice, right? And in that state of mind, full of faith in the teachings, in Guan Yin, in oneself, then Guan Yin's, calling on Guan Yin's name is, is a very powerful act, is, is an act um, that kind of transcends cause and effect in many ways. Um, and as I, I said earlier, it's like ultimately like the practitioner calling the Guan Yin that is the practitioner. Now, I also have to explain the meaning of the universal gate. Um, so that's the, the, the actual chap, uh, chapter, the um, Pumen, a universal gate is, is uh, the Bodhisattva. Oh, here's the cries of the world, the universal gate. So this gate is, I think, much like the, the, the gateless gate. This is, um, this is glossed as the universal means everywhere um, and, and at every time. It's, 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 it's inside and outside of time and space. And, and the gate is um, that which is penetrative without obstacles, which is always avail available. Um, there's a, uh, a great master called Auspicious Storehouse that Shurfu cites in his book that say, says in the universal gate appears all, all bodies, which are Dharma bodies, which I guess means you and me, which are liberation. So this, um, this is, breaks things wide open in terms of, of the practice. Um, it means that uh, we can be reached at, at any level in any way. And that is um, what, what Guan Yin, with our help and our help with Guan Yin is going to accomplish. Now, Guan Yin is, is considered the bodhisattva of compassion. So I have to talk a little bit about compassion, levels of compassion. Um, so in, in Mahayana texts, um, they're often distinguished on three levels. Um, one is the compassion based on the awareness of sentient beings which take sentient beings um, as, their, as their objects, called uh, sheng yu and um, And uh, this is the first um, form of compassion uh, generally uh, generated by regular persons, you and me. And um, you know, uh, as the, the sutra mentions, shravakas, prateka buddhas, bodhisattvas, um, it's called minor compassion. I mean, this is for, not, not a great bodhisattva. Then there, is, then there is the compassion based on the true nature of phenomena. That's fa yuan sabi. Um, that's where one experience, that's what one experiences after realizing the reality of selflessness of phenomena. Um, and that's um, at the level of arhats and behind and beyond. And then, then finally, and this is where we are with um, Guan Shi Yin, who saw, um, compassion without distinction, wu yan so uh, uh, This arises when one has fully abandoned discriminatory thought, discriminatory thought, and witnesses the absolute equality of thing, uh, only generated by Buddhas and maybe um, Avalokiteshvara, and it's known as uh, da se da be. And so. We're, we're working on a exceedingly deep and rarefied level with everything about Guan Shi, um, Guan Shi Yin, Pusa is, um, you know, this is why it's, it's called the Miraculous Lotus Sutra <laughs> because of um, these kind of things 
which are in a sense hidden deeply in the in the chapters you have to read them very carefully and with the help of a great master like like uh, Shurfu, you can you can find um the depth within it so now um just a, a brief thing of, about the the buddha and the bodhisattvas that are in the sutra there is of course shakyamuni and um uh, avalokiteshvara who i've just talked about uh, Wu Jin Yi, who is the interlocutor, the one who's really asking this question of why is Guan Shi Yin called Guan Shi Yin? Um, uh, he's the inexhaustible intention, um, and and I think the I, the fact that there is Guan Yin of compassion and Wu Jin uh, Wu Jin Yi as the essence of determination of um, intelligence. It's, it's kind of the merging of wisdom and compassion. Just, just in, you know, hinted at or stated explicitly, if one happens to be at that level, just in, the, in, in what's, what's going on in, this, in the chapter, how it's configured. Um, then of course, there is um, Duo Bao Pu um, uh, Rulai, the um, R R Ratna Sambhava, many treasures. He doesn't actually, his stupa appears um, you know, later in this chapter. And then finally, there is um, uh, Chur, Chur Di, um, uh, Dharani um, Dara, the earth holding Bodhisattva. And that Bodhisattva appearing at the end of the chapter is almost like the, um, all of these things, all of these teachings are being upheld, you know, and, and witnessed. Um, by you know this great bodhisattva and the earth. Now, I also now I want to just go through the sutra um, quickly and just point out some some things that might disabuse one of of thinking that this is just um, an example of these terrible things happening. People calling on on the Buddha and they get saved. You know, it's kind of you know boom boom boom. It, it's more like the the dangers that are mentioned like um, fire or a ship blown off course or being attacked by swords or um, billions of rakshas um, they're, they're more about internal fears as well as these external fears i mean this this chapter is really good for for us in our times with the kind of things we read about in the newspaper um, but we may have problems like uh, you know, our, our internet goes down or someone um, you know, uh, steals our identity or get a flat tire, all sorts of things. But generally speaking, we're not going to be um, annoyed by billions and billions of rakshas and yakshas. So when you read something like that, you have to see that it's at, at another level of, of, of vexation, of anxiety. Um, and when, if you are thrown in jail, whether you are uh, guilty or not, calling upon uh, Guan Shi Yin's name, once again, in understanding how I mean calling upon his name, um, then your fetters and chains will be broken. And this is kind of um, uh, also non, uh, a hint of non-duality. I almost say, you know, in, in reading this, when you're when you're looking at um, su superhero things like the Game of Thrones and um, Marvel comics things, which I, I watch with my son, they mention this thing of Easter eggs, these little little hints that that show something more profound. Now, I don't. I'm certainly not trying to, uh, you know, use this, you know, for for a great sutra like this. But I'm. I want to reach people in, in the way that we understand things, in the way that we interpret our culture. So you can look at some of the things that you, you encounter in the sutra and you can see um, what's, what's, what's behind it. You know, the idea of evil hearted bandits attacking merchants with treasures. Well, what kind of treasures could these be? It could be the treasures of the Dharma, right? It's not, not really stated. And one of the most important points that I'd like to make today is that Guan Shi Yin grants fearlessness 
and it will <clears throat> come out in terms of something some of you may be very familiar with is the three kinds of giving that are explained in the Dharma, the giving of um, material uh, goods or, or one's time, uh, the giving of the Dharma and the giving of fearlessness. And of course, when I first heard this, when I was first learning about the Dharma, I didn't quite understand how fearlessness could trump the, uh, the Dharma. But what fearlessness means is um, really liberation. It means no self. It's, it's, it's beyond the teachings. It's just, once again, what happens again and again in the Dharma is there's one key word which, um, you know, just suggests many, many, many other um, words, many other interpretations, much depth. And um, so once again, for the Buddhas and for Guan, Guan Shi Yin, these three types of giving are all available. They're all, they're all expedient means depending on the situation of the sentient being that's going to be helped. And uh, uh, just to mention again, the uh, the help is not simply from external, but also it mentions lust and desire, wrath and ire, ignorance and stupidity. Once again, calling on Guan Yin um, is uh, the way to work yourself towards the solution. And as I also mentioned, but to say again that um, you can, um, woman and uh, uh, I guess a woman and her husband could. Um, uh, call on Guan Shi Yin to help them have uh, a male child or a female child, and they will, they will be um, sons or daughters with merit, virtue, wisdom, and marks of comeliness, it says in one translation. Now, um, very interesting passage in the chapter, which I'd like to talk about. Uh, the, the Buddha says, that um, someone who upholds the name of 62 million or billion times the number of sands in the Ganges of Bodhisattva names and supplies various offerings to them, food and bedding and medicine, right? Says that they would gain um, many benefits and uh, Akya Samati says, yes, world honored one, they would. But then the, the Buddha says, suppose that someone accepts and upholds the name of the bodhisattva, perceiver of the world sounds, Guan, Guan Shi Yin Pu Sa, even just once and offers him obeisance and alms. That, that merit and virtue and good fortune is equal to the person's good um, fortune and merit that was cited above. Um, and it will last for an incalculable period of time. So the question is, what's going on here? How are we to interpret that? And I'm certainly not saying I have all the answers to that, but one of the things that Guan Shi Yin has, and it's very easy to compare this with the preceding chapter, is not only can Guan Shi Yin um, change his form to, um, the, to whatever is appropriate for the person he's helping, but Guan Shi Yin has this special Gan Ying, this special responsiveness, which is, um, which magnifies his spiritual power in, in such a way that just calling on him, just uh, averting your attention to Guan Shi Yin has these marvelous effects. And this is the preeminent quality of Guan Shi Yin's hearing. And, and once again, um, hearing, which is actually not exactly what's said in the, um, in, in the sutra, or maybe in Avalokiteshvara, the hearing is, is mentioned, but Guan uh, could be any, any kind of perception from any of the senses and beyond the senses. So it's a very, very deep kind of understanding uh, um, and, and integration with um, with a sentient being, and you know this the sutra um, this chapter is pointing to the, the power of that this this ability to intervene in a sentient being's karma by 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 teaching you know 
um, teaching the sentient being to become more com compassionate. You know, I, I don't think people are just lifted out of their, their misery um, specifically, although anyone who's familiar with um, uh, Chinese folklore, and this is beyond for, uh, folklore, there are, there are many collections in, um, in Chinese literature of stories of miraculous um, doings of uh, Guan Shiyin, helping people who are sick or being um, trapped. I mean, and these are not these are not fiction according to the way that they are presented. These are these are factual stories, which are, you know, one can um, take that however you you, you know you you can assimilate that. But this this really exists in, in, in the culture. And I'm, you know, uh, anything is possible. I wouldn't question these kind of things, but I'm, I'm working on what the, what the sutra actually speaks about. Um, so then um, uh, Akya Samati asks um, the, uh, the Buddha, how does Guan Yin move in the world? That's what it literally says. And me, actually, what does he do? And then this is where um, the Buddha outlines the 33 different kinds of forms that uh, Guan Shi Yin can uh, take in order to save uh, sentient beings. So it's not just hearing. So Guan Shi Yin also appears. He, he manifests. He um, uh, just um, has a, a presence which, um, which takes action. You know, so this is why he is such a great um, bodhisattva. And I'm not gonna mention all of the uh, different forms that he can take. Of course, it begins with uh, Guan Shi Yin can become a Buddha or a Prateka Buddha or a, vo a voice hearer, a Brahma king. And it goes down to um, a wealthy man, a householder, bhikshu, bhikshuni, upasaka, Upasika, you know, uh, monks, nuns, uh, lay men and women, um, boys or girls, and then any kind of god, dragon, yaksha, Gandharva, Ashura, Garuda, Kanara, Maharaga, human, non-human, and finally Vajrapani, the spirit who grasps the thunderbolt. And um, so he changes in different shapes. He travels everywhere to all worlds. There's no place not, not in his domain. Um, and he responds to single-minded offerings. I think once again, it's um, uh, for, and and I imagine that he can um, respond uh, just to just to the to the dire straits as well. And in, in some cases, I, I um, you know there there are mysteries I can't penetrate. So now now very uh, the the, um, the next and actually the last thing in the sutra in in a sense. Uh, the last um, major event comes, which is very interesting, and you have to watch this very carefully. So, um, uh, uh, Wu Jin Yi, inexhaustible intent or mind, tells the Buddha he will present an offering to Guan Yin. So he has um, a priceless, worth 100,000 taels of gold necklace around his neck. He unties it. And he offers it once as a Dharma gift to um, Guan Shi Yin, who refuses. Um, and he makes a gesture of refusing. Uh, in um, one translation it says he's unwilling, another one says he doesn't dare accept. So then he offers it again um, and uh, to accept it out of compassion or pity uh, for sentient beings. Guan Yin refuses again. And then the Buddha intervenes and says, out of compassion for this bodhisattva, you know, inexhaustible intent, and for the four kinds of believers, um, you know, which we, we talked about, the um, monks, nuns, uh, laymen and women, and the heavenly beings, dragons, yakshas, gandharvas, asuras, garudas, kinar um, kinaras, maha ragas, humans, and non-human beings, you should accept the necklace. So then Guan Yin accepts it. And, you know, and it says having compassion for the four kinds of believers and the heavenly beings, and so on. And then he divides it into two parts. 
He presents one part to Shakyamuni and presents the other to the tower of many treasures Buddha. I mean, um, I, I'm assuming he's presenting it to the Ratnasambhava in the tower. And um, so, and the Buddha summarizes that inexhaustible ten, uh, uh, intent, he said, these are the freely exercised supernatural powers um, that Bodhisattva, the perceiver of the world, displays in his comings and goings in the Saha world. That after this whole necklace has um, been ex exchanged and split. Um, so let's talk about splitting of the uh, necklace. So Guan, Guan Yin is a conduit in this, right? He's really not giving or taking, interestingly enough. And that this is once again pointing to this the non-dualistic, um, not no subject, no object nature of his um, of his attainment and how he moves and acts in the world. So Shakyamuni is the the Dharma Kaya, right, representative, and and the stupa, uh, Rat, Ratna, Ratnasam uh, Bhava is the um, uh, infinitized um, resourcefulness, the um, the uh, assurity of the, the the lineage of Buddhas from beginningless time uh, to you know without end, and so. You can compare this uh, in, in chapter 24, Wonderful Voice presents um, Shakyamuni with a necklace and um, the Buddha accepts it. Here, there's, there's a much more of a um, uh, subtle understanding. So it's once again, symbolic of the non-duality, the relative and, and the absolute, and I guess of the, the middle. Um, so once again, quoting from um, Shurfu's uh, book on, <clears throat> on the Lotus Sutra. One second. It says in the 12th scroll of the great master of auspicious storehouse Dharma flower commentary. This precious offering is called a Dharma offering, um, which is explained as follows. The offering of the speaking of the Dharma is a true offering that spreads the Dharma, but it is also an offering of the cause of Dharma, which I, I think is quite significant it's um you know it's what's what's the dharma and what's behind the dharma you know in a way what what causes the dharma and and he says this also achieves non-dualistic dharma riches and uh so and then another another commentary says that this is this dividing of two um represents um, the the uh, the normal way that sentient beings understand reality and the reality of the Dharma is that only a Buddha can fathom with another Buddha, and this amounts uh, to the Buddha's realization stage of all Buddha realms. Uh, quoting, um, so there's um, there are some other. Uh, parts in this that I, I want to um, emphasize that uh, so the once we've finished the sutra then we get into the um, the verse the verse uh, well we finished the, the the prose and now the verse part which which actually has um, more information and more subtle information I mean there's one one thing where it says that if you are climbing Mount Sumer, Sumeru and someone pushes you off, um, you will, um, with mindfulness strength, you, you'll, you'll dwell in space like the sun. And at first, you know, I, I read that thinking that, oh, no, someone's going to try and jump off a mountain or something like this. But then it's Mount Sumeru, right? Um, anyone who can climb Mount Sumeru, I hope they send me a postcard um, because um, this is just showing um, that is, it's beyond ordinary understanding of, of, of danger. I mean, climbing Mount Sumeru could be, you know, trying to um, uh, practice and become a Buddha could be mean almost anything, really. I mean, in, in, in that realm. Um, and then there are more um, 
difficult circumstances with malicious beasts, beasts and, and with sharp claws and not um, noxious insects with that deadly breath and striking wonder, uh, striking thunder and lightning. Um, and this is all with um, uh, all with the power of Guan Yin's wonderful wisdom. This is the, the, that addresses all of these these misfortunes. And it says in the 10 directions, there is no place where he does not manifest himself. And one of the things that this is, I think this is also very important to point out and that Sherfu, um, you know, describes in his book is the, the silence. So in this chapter, Guan Shi Yin um, Pusa did not say a single word. Right? And you can compare this in a subtle or obviously a way with Vimela Kirti, you know, who um, in one of the chapters is asked um, a, a, a very esoteric question about um, emptiness and he remains silent. And, and this is, that's the proper answer. That is the, the most profound answer. Of course, any of us can remain silent. It's not, it's not our kind of silence. This is a very different thing. And here, Guan Shi Yin is silent. And so he only made motions of um, not receiving offerings, accepting offerings, and transferring offerings. So all of these kind of um, material phenomenal acts of giving and receiving um, refusing all of these things, which we understand in a particular way, um, that is something that is in Guan Shi Yin's awareness, but he has no attachments. So the remaining silent, ex uh, silent expresses the pure ultimate essence of things, the ultimate essence of things that is inseparable from wisdom and um, wisdom's function or compassion. Um, and so, and, and this is, once again, this is, this is how Guan Shi Yin um, appears and disperses fear. So, um, actually, um, getting, I'm getting to uh, pretty much what I wanted to cover. And there, there, there are actually this, there are many, many more things in, in this verse section um, where Shurfu goes into the, the Tiantai interpretations of five voices that are part of um, Avalokiteshvara's um, ability to use expedient means. And once again, they're, 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 they're all within these kind of realms of absolute and relative and the um, middle, which actually could be translated as lessness itself. And so, um, you know, what, what I'd like to, to do, just to end, since we uh, have a minute, now, as I said, there was this kind of remarkable coincidence that um, a prayer for, um, uh, for Avalokiteshvara opened up right in my, um, my email this morning. It, it, I actually was in Facebook, it was the first thing I opened and there it was. So I thought it might be um, good to, uh, um, well, let, let, let me close with the, um, actually the, the, the ending of the sutra just to make everything tight because let me go to the top. So, May the virtuous merits adorn and purify the pure land of the Buddhas. Upwardly, we repay the four layers of gratitude. Downwardly, we alleviate the suffering of the three destinies. May those who see and hear the Dharma generate Bodhi mind, exhausting this mind of retribution. May we be reborn in the land of extreme bliss. Okay, so here's the prayer to Avalokiteshvara. Namo Guru Lokesh Varaya. In essence, you are the embodiment 
of all sources of refuge. Gracious Lama of Avalokiteshvara, to you I pray. Om Mani Padmi Hum, Om Mani Padmi Hum. Venerable Master, grant your blessings. Great Compassionate One, grant your blessings. Avalokiteshvara, grant your blessings. Protector of beings, grant your blessings. <clears throat> Lord of the world, grant your blessings. Supreme among Buddha's heirs, grant your blessings. Wish granting jewel, grant your blessings. Om Mani Padmi Hum, Om Mani Padmi Hum. For me and all beings, my very own mothers, grant your blessings. <clears throat> so malice and savagery may be assuaged. Grant your blessings so intentions and actions are made virtuous. Grant your blessings so illness, harmful influences and obstacles are pacified. Grant your blessings so misdeeds, obscurations, faults and downfalls are purified. Grant your blessings so we may master the supreme mind of bodhicitta. Grant your blessings so we may carry out bodhisattva activity. Grant your blessings so all our relationships become meaningful. Grant your blessings so we, we may be reborn in the land of perfect bliss. Grant your blessings so we may attain Buddhahood for others' sakes. Om Mani Padme Hum. 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 So thank you, everybody. It was a great joy to be here with you. Thank you so much, Harry, for your wonderful talk. And uh, excuse me. Uh, sorry. Sure. I'm happy to take questions, you know. Uh, uh, do, shall we open up an opportunity for everyone to ask in questions? can take a little time. So uh, uh, there was a lot going on in this sutra, right? Which might 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 surprise you, you know, if, if um, people who read this, um, will, you know, haven't had access to Shurfu. <laughs> uh, it, it really changes things. And it seems that uh, there is no questions. Uh, excuse me, everybody, Savas, if you have any questions, uh, you can just raise your hands or uh, just type the question into the chat box. Thank you. Uh, oh, uh, Jean-Paul, Jean please. How are you? That was uh, fantastic. I'm very grateful. Uh, just, is there a particular sutra uh, in addition to this Lotus Sutra that would explain the history of Guanyin Pusa? And, and uh, like, for example, I had read that Guanyin Pusa, uh, Avalokitesvara, helps people to cross the sea of suffering. Mm -hmm. And and I was touched by that. And uh, I, I kind of, I understood it. But is, is there a particular literature or book that you would recommend in addition to well, the Sutra? Well, there, there's, um, well, you know, there is this that passage I read in the Shurangama Sutra. And, and um, Avalokiteshvara certainly appears there. And Avalokiteshvara is the... Uh, uh, is the Bodhisattva that is described in the Heart Sutra. Okay. Uh, I think he yes. appears, uh, and he certainly appears in, in the Avatamsaka Sutra, I believe. I'm not sure of that. Um, but I, offhand, uh, 
you know, I, I'm not sure. I mean, they, they, that chapter about his his method of um, deep listening, of turning listening inward to his true nature, that's um, that's sometimes circulated uh, by itself. Thank so, you, you know, whatever. Yes. Yeah. Shurangama Sutra Avatam Saka Sutra. Yeah. Thanks much. Uh, excellent. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> Be well, everyone. Thanks. Uh, And thank you. And uh, excuse me, Harry. Uh, shall we uh, open up another question? Yeah, sure. I'm, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm in no rush. <laughs> I know you have other things to do, but I'm I'm happy to sit here for as long as people want. Um, Michael. Uh, hello, Henry. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask a question. Just um, somebody said that uh, in um, in this chapter, uh, let's say because in the content, uh, they always talk uh, um, help, uh, just help, how to help people. Uh, so let, somebody said that they are just uh, uh, to fulfill some basic need of general people and the samadhi of Chan, uh, maybe not so much, but uh, uh, maybe not so much, but, but it also match with the spirit of Chan. So how, how do you think about it, about, about this kind of, uh, yeah. Oh, the spirit, that's a, that's a, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, well, I think Chan is a very wide, all embracing practice and doesn't you know just um, advocate you know developing deep samadhis because there is there is compassion and there is wisdom and there there are many many things um, especially in the Chinese community that um, involve um, Guanyin repentance for example and, and many many ways uh, that that we many things we can call on to address our, our innumerable vexations, and so this 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 sutra seems uh, this particular chapter seems to include both these things because they're talking about Yixin, one mind, you know, which is um, a, a, a deep kind of um, meditative state, uh, understanding, and. Um, it's lo looking into um, the actual situations that that people get get into. So the, it's the kind of it's really Chan, Chan um, Samadhi, which is not really spoken about that much, but when it is, it's really understood as as a Samadhi that's kind of in the world, which is what Guan Shuryin is. He he has this um, great, great attainment, you know, a, a perfectly tranquil mind, an unmoving mind, yet he can detect what's going on with sentient beings um, and, and can be helpful. And I think that kind of proactive understanding of, of our practice is, is, is relevant for you and me. You know, we, we don't want to just exclude ourselves from the world. We want to be in the world and to be as um, active and helpful and compassionate as we, we possibly can. <laughs>